we'll go to our deep dive uh, into New King Palmers. We're dealing with a play here in a document, both by this guy, Peter Callum. The play is this satire on British royalty, New King Palmers. But along with that, we have Talk, 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 which seems to be like a chronicle of the play's creation and Callum's own uh, experiences. But it's all woven together in this really blurry way. Yeah, it's interesting right away because Talk, 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 it's not just commentary. It's like written as if it's a real account by this fictional Peter Callum. So it makes you question right away what's real and what's made up. Right, like we're already in on some secret trying to figure out Callum's game. So for our listener, imagine a modern day British king named Chads, and he's grappling with, you know, everything from EU politics to these media scandals. And that's the satirical world of nuking Palmers, yeah. jumping between scenes in this royal court, and then these, like, almost dreamlike allegorical sequences. And these sequences, they're not just there for show. They seem to be Callum's way of getting at these big ideas, like power, history, you know, that tension between what's real and what's not. He's using this fictional king to comment on how stories are controlled and how they can be used. Okay, so we've got King Chads trying to navigate this world with all these, uh, I guess you'd call them operators. There's Simon Starr, this popular musician the king really likes. But he kind of represents this clash between like pop culture and tradition. Then you've got Palmer's, this super sharp business manager, always working an angle. Like he's the embodiment of how art and money are tied together. It's almost like Callum is showing us the entertainment industry itself, how art gets used, how it becomes a product. And then you have Madame Zemlinsky, this fortune teller, adding a layer of mystery to it all. She's got these weird ties to everyone else. Makes you wonder if she's the one really in control. Yeah, hard to tell who's using who. Which brings us to Peter Callum himself from Talk, Talk, Talk. We get this picture of him being tied up in this play. Yeah, this mentor, Earl Doc. This mysterious figure, maybe even linked to European nobility. And his relationship with this Earl is messed up, you know? He sees him as a guide, but also someone who really hurt him. This back and forth, it makes you wonder if the Earl was even real or just some symbol for Callum. And then you add in the fact that Callum had this unusual upbringing, spending time in a commune, but also with his rich dad in California a computer tech pioneer, no less. Like, he's straddling two completely different worlds. That's key, though. Callum's tech background, it's not just a fun fact. It seems to be informing how New King Palmer's is structured, even the themes. Think about code. It's all logic, being exact, having control. Those ideas are all over this play. So we've got this play that's already messing with our sense of reality. And then Callum drops these bombshells and talk, talk, talk. He brings up Crown Prince Rudolph, his suicide, back in the late 1800s and hints that maybe it was the Dioc family covering up a murder to stay in power. And what's really creepy is how he compares that to Princess Diana's death, implying that both were victims of powerful forces working in secret. Yeah, like, is he onto something real? Or is this all part of his own manipulation, making it even harder to tell what's real? Then he introduces us to Daphne, sometimes called Laurel. She's directing the play, and she is persistent, trying to bring new King Palmers to the stage no matter what. Her journey is fascinating, though, because it's like a mini version of the play's themes, battling for money, facing the media, dealing with all the politics of the theater world. It's like she becomes part of this game Callum made, this whole power and manipulation thing. Right. And then we have this shadowy guy, Taylor S. He's after Callum, wants the play's manuscript. Callum describes phone calls, people watching him, even break-ins, like something out of a spy movie. And here's where it gets really meta. Callum, who made this whole fictional world about power struggles, Suddenly, he's in a real-life situation where he's the target. Who's really in control? Is this part of the fiction or something darker? Yeah, good question. We've just scratched the surface here, but we're seeing these themes over and over. Power, using people, hidden motives. It's like Callum is using New King Palmer's and Talk, Talk, Talk to take apart how stories are shaped, not just in the play, but in our own lives. And what's striking is how Callum seems to be in the game and watching it at the same time. He made this web of fiction, but he's also caught in it. It makes you wonder, what's his goal? What's he really trying to say? Let's dig into New King Palmer's itself a bit more. Callum sets the scene in this weird saloon, not a Wild West saloon though, he describes these high ceilings, Victorian stuff, this wallpaper that sounds suffocating, like a place full of tradition, but also feeling wrong somehow. Right. He even mentions the smell of, like, old cigarette smoke stuck in the walls, like the ghosts of all these deals and arguments are still hanging around. And it's in this setting that we meet these two tabloid journalists. 
already gossiping about King Chad's, looking for anything scandalous. He makes him seem so cynical, almost predatory, like a reminder of how the media can twist things, use people's weaknesses for a headline. And through them, we start to see the pressure Chad's is under. His popularity is tanking, there's political stuff happening, and the media is always on him. It's like a second crown, but heavy and you can't take it off. And then there's this whole EU situation lurking in the background. Callum doesn't get into the specifics, but it's obvious that Britain and the EU are having problems, <laughs> mirroring some real world anxieties, right? Totally. Like he's tapping into those fears about countries and the world, you know? He even mentions this Sir Nigel, he's the foreign secretary, sent to Gaul to try and fix things. But you get the feeling everyone's got their own motives and Chad's is stuck in the middle. Classic power struggle, but in this exaggerated satirical world. And then there's Princess Moon, Chad's wife but they're separated. She's become this media darling, playing the game perfectly, while Chad's is trying to hold on to this image of being dignified and in control. Makes me think of like real life celebrities, the ones yeah. who seem to know how to handle the spotlight. It's so interesting how Callum uses these surface level details like clothes, money, being seen in the right places to show how power really works, both in the play and in the real world. Yeah, it's all about image. And just when we think we're getting this political satire, he throws us this curveball, this scene in the giant's castle. It's like we're in a different place suddenly. Whimsical, strange, a little creepy. Gotta remember, New King Palmers keeps switching between these two worlds. Right, the real and the uh, symbolic. This is where Callum's creativity shines, I think. He describes this giant boo coming down from the ceiling, a golden harp that's a person, these holes in the ground that can swallow you up, like a dream, but with this undercurrent of danger. Yeah, you can't shake the feeling that this giant's castle stands for something bigger. We meet Jack. He feels like the average guy, exploring this weird place with a barmaid. They're drawn to the giant's treasure, but also know it's risky. Reminds me of those stories where people get tempted by power and wealth, but it costs them something. And remember that hee-haw nut. Supposedly stops you from being hungry, but messes with your head. Such a good metaphor for how power can change how you see things. You get seduced by stuff that ends up hurting you. Right, and then there's that image of the giant's ancestors, like falling through the earth, eaten by dinosaurs. Yeah. It's funny, but scary, too. Like Calum saying, even empires can fall apart, be forgotten. It's a warning. History repeats itself, you know. And it ties back to those hidden motives we see in Chad's court. Like he's saying these bigger forces, history, fate, wanting power. They're always shaping things, whether we realize it or not. So we've got these two parallel stories going on. The political satire with Chad's and the weirdness of the giant's castle. How do they connect? What's Callum's point? I think they're two sides of the same coin. The castle represents these big forces at work, the stuff we can't see that drives history. But Chad's court shows how that stuff plays out in people's lives, how it shapes what they do, their relationships, everything. Like the castle is the why and the court is the how. One is all symbolic. The other is personal mm -hmm. about real people. And it's through that contrast that Callum makes his point about the world. Exactly. And don't forget the characters themselves. They're all so specific. Like they each represent a part of power or ambition. You've got Chad's trapped by tradition, wanting to be happy, but also having to be king. It's kind of tragic, right? Mm -hmm. Stuck in this role, wanting real connection, but surrounded by people using him. Then there's Simon Starr, the musician. He's got this talent, this connection with people, but he's also kind of clueless. Easy for people to use him. And Palmer's the business guy. He's like pure ambition, the ruthless side of the entertainment world. He doesn't care about art. It's all about money and being in control, pulling strings behind the scenes, always looking for the next opportunity. Yeah, reminds you how art can become just another product. Mm -hmm. And what's smart is that Callum doesn't make these characters all good or all bad. Mm -hmm. They're complicated, messed up, driven by their own stuff. Makes you think about what power really is, who has it, how it changes people. And the way Callum writes, it's so vivid, so precise. He creates these images you don't forget, these conversations that sound real. He uses humor and satire, but there's always this darkness underneath. Like he's using jokes to say serious things about society, how we lie to ourselves and each other. And then just when we think we understand this fictional world, he throws in real history, things that make you question everything. He keeps mentioning the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially Crown Prince Rudolf and his suicide. He implies it was actually the Doc family killing him off to protect themselves. And then he goes even further, comparing that to Princess Diana, like both were victims of these powerful people working in secret. It's a big claim, and who knows how much is true. 
But Callan's clearly interested in how history gets twisted, how the truth gets hidden. He's always blurring the lines, making us think about what we believe. Which brings us back to talk, talk, talk. This document that's about making the play, the people involved, but so much more. Like we're seeing behind the curtain all the messy stuff that goes into making art. And through that, we get to know Callum himself. His struggles with writing, dealing with the director and actors, trying to handle this world where art and money are always bumping into each other. And it's in those moments that he feels real, relatable, like even brilliant people doubt themselves, get frustrated. And let's talk about Daphne, the director. Callum portrays her as strong, passionate, really dedicated to the play, but she's got a ton of obstacles getting money, difficult actors, dealing with the politics around the play's themes. It's like she's always balancing, trying to stay true to what the play is saying, but also dealing with the real world. And her relationship with Calum is interesting. Respect, admiration, but also tension, disagreement. They clash over creative stuff, how to stage things. But they both believe in the power of new King Palmers to make people think. It's a classic creative partnership, you know? Yeah. Full of passion, but also friction. They push each other to do their best. And then you have the actors themselves. Callum gives us these little portraits of each one, their personalities, their quirks, what they're good at, what they're not. He's a great observer of people, and he uses that to create this whole cast, each actor bringing something different to the play. He even mentions how some actors get so into their roles that the line between them and the character blurs, like the play is leaking into reality, affecting everyone. And it's in Talk, Talk, Talk that Taylor S. really steps forward. He's like a ghost haunting Callum, always there, but just out of sight. Yeah, Callum describes these creepy encounters with S, but we never know what he wants. He wants the manuscript, but his motives are a mystery. Is he from the government? Another playwright. Just Callum being paranoid. It's intriguing, but also unsettling. It's like S embodies the themes of the play, being watched, being controlled. He's this reminder that we're never really free. Someone's always watching, shaping what we see, what we do. And Callum trying to get away from S to protect the play. It creates this feeling of suspense paranoia that becomes part of the story itself like we're right there with him looking over our shoulder wondering who's watching us and remember we're still trying to figure out Callum himself he's this complicated guy shaped by his weird upbringing earl doc his love of tech and in talk 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 we get glimpses into his personal life his relationships his problems he mentions his dad martin keys this brilliant but distant guy a computer pioneer but not good with feelings. Yeah, their relationship was definitely messy. Admiration and resentment makes you wonder how that affected how Callum writes about fathers and sons in the play. And then there's Earl Doc, mentor, friend, almost like a father figure. Mm -hmm. But so mysterious, we never know what he's really up to. It's like he stands for some legacy that Callum's both drawn to and running from. Like he's trying to balance these two parts of himself, the logical side he got from his dad and the creative side he connects with the Earl. And that struggle, finding his own identity, seems to be at the heart of New King Palmers. So we've got the plot, the characters, the themes, how it connects to the real world. We've looked at Callum's life, his relationships, how he creates. And we've touched on the mystery of Taylor S. and the manuscript. But there's one more thing I want to mention before we move on. The play's ending. Ah, yes, the ending. Dramatic, but ambiguous. More questions than answers. It takes place in this bleak setting, a hellish industrial wasteland in East London. Callum describes being led through this maze of broken machines by a blind man. Like going down into hell, a journey into darkness. Yeah. It mirrors how the play explores power and how people are used. And at the end of this journey, he meets Roy Plateau, a powerful guy who seems to represent the control and surveillance that's been hidden throughout the play. Right. And Plateau reveals he's been watching Callum's every move knows all about him trying to control the play and the story it tells. It's a creepy moment realizing you're not as in control as you thought. And it's interesting how Plateau's blind, but he sees everything. A great metaphor for how real power works behind the scenes. Yeah, you don't even see it happening. The play's last lines are really haunting. Callum's left wondering how much power Plateau really has, and if he can ever escape. It's an ending that sticks with you, makes you think about who's really controlling things in our own lives. And it speaks to the big themes of the play, the illusion of control, how weak we really are, these forces we can't even understand. It reminds us that even in a world we create, we're never totally free. 
So we've touched on this really rich and complex play, The Man Who Made It, The Mysteries Inside It. But before we wrap up, I want to go back to something we mentioned earlier, the role of music in New King Palmer's. Oh, yes. Music is everywhere in the play. Literally, like with scenes of people playing, but also metaphorically, you have the haunting performance in the giant's castle and the lively scene in Pincher's shop, which, if you recall, is like a safe space for artists and musicians. So different from the cold, controlled world of the royal court. Right. It's like music represents this pure expression, a way to connect with something deeper beyond words and logic. And remember how Callum talks about listening to jazz and classical music as a kid, how that shaved him. It's obvious that music means something special to him, almost like a key to unlock a deeper meaning. He even mentions this 13,000 Jelly song. It pops up throughout the play like a code you need to crack. It makes you wonder if there's a hidden message in the music itself. Yeah. Something only certain people can hear which takes us back to those layers of meaning, the hidden stuff. It's like Callum's daring us to look deeper, to listen closely, to pay attention to the little details that might reveal something big. And maybe that's how you understand New King Palmer's and talk, 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 embrace the ambiguity, lean into the questions, get lost in this mix of fiction and reality. Because it's not about getting all the answers right. It's about the journey, exploring, making your own meaning. And that's what makes Callum's work so rewarding, so thought-provoking. It stays with you. You know, we've talked about all these layers of meaning, these themes that keep popping up in New King Palmer's in Talk, Talk, Talk. But there's this thing about Callum's background that I just, I can't let go of it. His computer background. Yeah, it's like this hidden code underneath everything. Exactly. It's not your typical playwright, you know. And I feel like it's key to understanding his work. I think you're right. It's not just a fun fact about him. It's like the lens he sees the world through. Think about how he puts the play together. There's this precision to it, this logic, even in the weirdest scenes. Now that you mention it, that scene in the giant's castle, the boot, the heart yeah. that's a person, mm -hmm. it's so visual, so imaginative, mm -hmm. but there's also this order to it. Like it's all planned out. Yeah, like he's treating storytelling like a programmer writes code. Every piece has a reason. Every line of dialogue does something. It's all connected like some complicated algorithm. And the language is so precise, almost like clinical sometimes. He uses these technical words, even when he's talking about like deep philosophical stuff. It's like she's bridging these two worlds, technology and art. And he's not just comparing them. He's showing how they're already linked. Think about the play's themes. Control, manipulation, hidden agendas. That's a world of technology, too, especially now with all the digital stuff. Yeah, it's like he's using his tech knowledge to take apart how power works in this information age we're in. Remember how he implies the UK is trying to control the EU in the play? Makes you think about how data, algorithms, all that is being used to shape what people think in real life. Absolutely. And the way he shows those tabloid journalists so hungry for a story, it's scary how accurate that is, how the media can twist things. Like we're all in this giant network of information being programmed without even knowing it, whether it's algorithms or the news or politicians. And that's what makes his work so, I don't know, unsettling, but also important. He's holding up a mirror, making us see how we're being controlled. So we've talked about how his background shapes his writing, the themes he's interested in. But what about Callum himself? The guy behind all this, what'd you think of him? He's interesting, right? You have this like split in him. He's so smart, but also emotionally detached. Like he's in the world, but also outside it, watching through a computer screen. Totally. Remember how he describes his childhood home in California? All these details, like he's taking inventory. But then he mentions that Mexican guitar and there's this sudden emotion, like he wants to connect, wants something more than just cold logic. Yeah, and that struggle plays out in his relationships, too. He's drawn to people, but keeps them at a distance. Think about Daphne. There's respect. They work together, but there's this wall there. Like he's afraid to get too close, too vulnerable. And then there's his dad, this genius who's also emotionally shut off. It's like Callum both wants to be him and wants to be nothing like him. It's like he's trying to figure out those two sides in himself. Logic versus feeling. Wanting to connect, but being afraid to. And that's what New King Palmer's is about, too, I think. Yeah, it makes you think, but it also makes you feel things. It's full of ideas, but it's also personal. Yeah. About him trying to figure out who he is. Which brings us to that big question we keep coming back to. What's Callum trying to do with this play? What's the message? It's tough to say. He doesn't give us easy answers. No solutions. Just this web of ideas and problems for us to think about. Maybe that's the whole point. He's not preaching. He wants us to think for ourselves, to question what we're told. Like he's saying, this is the world as I see it. Now you figure it out. 
And what about Taylor S., the manuscript? That's this loose end that hangs over everything. Yeah, we're left with so many questions. Who was he? What did he want? Did he get what he was after? And Callum never tells us. It's all up to us to decide. Maybe that's the biggest takeaway. There are no easy answers, just questions, interpretations, mysteries we have to wrestle with. And maybe the power of nuking Palmer's isn't in the answers, but in the questions. The ambiguity, the tension, that feeling that something's not quite right. Those are the things that stay with you, that make you think. So to our listener, embrace the mystery. Ask the questions. Let Callum's work challenge you, make you think differently. Because the best journeys don't always take you to a destination. They take you to a deeper understanding of yourself and the world around you. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We hope you found it as thought-provoking as we did.